and we can get going. Uh, my name is Liza Bernard, and on behalf of Norman Williams Public Library, I welcome you to this special Saturday event with Ethan Tapper, who is the author of How to Love a Forest, The Bittersweet Work of Tending a Changing World. World. And I want to thank our co-hosts, the Yankee Bookshop, who donate a portion of proceeds of their book sales at these author events back to the library so we can keep the cycle of events going and to Woodstock Community Television for recording the talk, which will be available later on their website and on our website if you want to share it with friends and other forest lovers. Um, and uh, one last note is I encourage you to sign up for a mailing list on the credenza in the back if, so you don't miss other events that are coming up. And of course, we're planning into the new year and there's a lot of stuff to go on. But today we welcome Ethan Tapper, who is a forester and a writer based in Vermont. Um, he's up near Camel's Hump, where he manages Bear Island, which is a 175 acre forest and his homestead. Since 2012, he's worked as a consulting forester and service forester, managing public and private forest lands and advising thousands of landowners. He writes a regular newspaper column and contributes to Northern Woodlands which, is everybody familiar with Northern Woodlands? It's a wonderful magazine, it's a quarterly publication. Ethan has um, received numerous awards and distinctions, including being named Forester of the Year um, by the Northeast Midwest State Foresters Alliance. And um, I wanted to just close my introduction with a quote from Doug um, Tallamy, who is the author of Nature's Best Hope. And he wrote about this book, Quote, rarely has our personal responsibility for the natural world that supports us been so eloquently articulated. Ecological wisdom abounds in Ethan, Ethan Tapper's story of restoration, wisdom that needs to be spread far and wide and fast. So without further ado, please help me welcome Ethan. I'm Ethan, and I'm here to, today talk to you about my book, How to Love a Forest. I was about to hold up my book. My book is getting pretty beat up. This is my 30th book event since the book came out, September 10th. Almost halfway done with the tour. Um, but instead, I wanted to show you this very nice copy. Look at this thing. It's so surreal to be up here and to get to talk to you all about this. Um, I started this journey of writing this book about eight years ago. and. I was just responding to a bunch of different things. Uh, working with people in the woods, working with these forests that have so many, are dealing with so many harmful legacies of the past and threats and stressors in the present and this incredibly uncertain and scary future. And realizing how consistently folks uh, misunderstood or at least incompletely understood forests and other ecosystems and what it means to care for them. And I figured out that the time when my brain worked the best for writing was the most creative and productive was the first hour that I'm awake, five to six in the morning. And I just had this experience of doing this practice, writing for an hour every single day for six years. And you know, when I started for the first couple of years, I really like didn't allow myself to believe that I was actually writing a book. I was just like, trying to write something and responding to these things that I was feeling and these misconceptions. And then after about three years, I let myself start to believe that's, that, that that's what I was doing. And then a mere three years later, it was done, right? And then of course you like, si I signed the contract with the publisher and I'm like, this thing's gonna be out next week. And they're like, so your publication date is in two years. Uh, and so it's just been such a, a surreal thing to get to share it all with you all and to talk to so many people about it. So I'm a forester. Right now I'm a consulting forester, which is what most foresters in Vermont are, which means that I work with private landowners, which is really important in Vermont because our state is like 75% forested and 80% of those lands are owned privately, just by people. And those lands, of course, are supporting our lives and our quality of life in countless ways. And they're cleaning our air and cleaning our water. They're making our green mountains green. They're supporting our state ecologically and culturally and economically in all of these different ways. And most of those forests are just taken care of by people. And to be a forest landowner or a steward, you don't need a degree. You don't have to pass any test. You just kind of get to do it. 
And so that's what the job of the forester is, a consulting forester, is to help those people figure out how we're gonna care for these precious and irreplaceable ecosystems. And I really think that uh, as I've progressed as a forester, the way that I've thought about my relationship with forests has changed. I think at, once I, uh, at one time I thought that my whole role as a forester was like mitigation. That I was like, oh my God, there's all these scary things happening to our forests. They're dealing with all these issues and it's our job to try and just like stop the leaks in this leaky boat. Try and just like stem this flood of bad things. And I had a bunch of experience one of the most formative ones was on my own land, Bear Island, which we'll talk about in a moment, of really realizing that this act of caring for our lands actively and humbly and bravely can be much more than that. That it can be an act of generation and regeneration, that it can be an act of love. And that many of the things that we can do and that we must do to care for our ecosystems in this moment are these incredibly bittersweet things. I mean, one of the things I talk about a lot in the book is like cutting a tree. And that even that, when you start to delve into the nuances of like where our forests are at and where they're coming from and where they're going can be these incredibly profound expressions of compassion. So uh, this book, what I say, you know, my like tagline for this book is that it's a reimagining of forests and what it means to care for them. And I would say that this is much less of a book that's like a recipe book about, okay, you have these trees and this is exactly what you do. And you cut this one and you don't cut this other one. And it's much more of a book about the land ethic. What is our relationship to ecosystems? What could it be at this moment in time? So, a lot of my time has been spent doing public outreach, trying to educate people about where our forests are at and what measures are necessary to protect them. And one thing that I've noted in walking the woods with thousands of people is that the public perception is that there's this dichotomy. That over here are the people who love forests, right? These are the people who are like, yes, forests are beautiful and valuable and irreplaceable. And the way that we love forests is by doing nothing, by taking our hands off them, by removing ourselves from these ecosystems. And then over here, we have people who do stuff to forests, people who cut trees, people who maybe kill deer, people who engage in these ecosystems more actively. And surely these people must be people that don't care, right? Because it makes perfect sense to believe that to cut a beautiful tree could never be something that someone who loves a forest could do. And one thing that I like to get into with this book is really delving into the nuances of this moment in time and where our forests are at and understanding how some of these bittersweet acts can be actually the most powerful expressions of care and compassion. So uh, a little bit about me. I am, I was born in Vermont. Saxton's River, Vermont. Anybody know Saxton's River? Wyndham County, Connecticut River Valley. Um, surrounded by forests. Little town, 300 people. But, you know, it, unlike many of the nature authors and, and people who work in, you know, biology and ecology who tell you these stories about how they were always like the nature kid and they were like crawling around on the ground looking at bugs and catching snakes, frogs. I don't remember that being my experience at all. Uh, what I really remember was that I wanted to get out of there and go somewhere else. And I remember when I was a junior in high school, I said, I don't know where I'm going to go to college, but I know where I'm not going to go. And that's the University of Vermont. Because everybody goes there, and I'm getting out of here. And then the first semester of my senior year of high school, I got a letter from the University of Vermont that said that I got this scholarship called the Green and Gold Scholarship, a full scholarship. And I was like, guess I'm going to the University of Vermont. Uh, but I still didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I was like kind of bumbling around, spent two semesters there. And I was still dating my high school girlfriend, the first big love of my life. And she went on this big wilderness expedition that was five months long. And when she came back, 
she had had this like incredibly transformative experience. And I hadn't. And we weren't connecting. And I was really afraid that we were going to break up. 18 years old. So I was like, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going on a wilderness expedition. And the next one left in two weeks. And it was a six-month expedition where we skied north for three months in the wintertime. And then we built a canoe, and we canoed back down. And now, in retrospect, I did this for no reason. However, it turned out to be this incredibly uh, transformative experience in my life that then led me to all of the most important things in my life today. So after that, all I wanted to do was just be in the woods. And I worked as a wilderness guide. And I lived in this uninsulated yurt with a fur bow floor in the woods of Maine for a year. And I apprenticed with this draft horse logger. And then I got a letter from the University of Vermont that said, you got to come back or you're going to lose your scholarship. And so I remember sitting on the floor of my yurt and holding a paper list of all the majors at the University of Vermont. And I scrolled down the list and I saw forestry. And I didn't know what it was, but I knew that it had the word forest in it, truly. And I was like, I guess we'll try that. Now, luckily, ended up being a really good fit, obviously. And it's also an amazing thing to study. So it is completely unique among all the other environmental sciences, the natural sciences, in that uh, it's the study of an entire ecosystem. So you have like entomologists who study bugs, and botanists who study plants, and ornithologists who study birds. And foresters are responsible for forests, which are these entire ecosystems comprised of all of these interconnected pieces and parts. And the other thing that's really unique about forestry is that it's a discipline of action. So unlike all of those other fields of study, we are ingrained in us is the idea that we do not have to be bystanders. That we can go into these ecosystems that have all of these very real problems, and we don't just like look at them and diagnose them and say, well, that's the way it is. We do something about it. And so what I often tell people is like, if you want to know every little plant on your land, call a botanist. If you want to know every little insect, call an entomologist. If you want to get a fine-tuned idea of all of the, the, the natural communities down to a super fine point, call an ecologist. And if you want to do something about any of those things, call a forester. So a lot of that idea, this idea that like we can actually have a relationship with ecosystems that is both loving and active is infused throughout this book. And it's very important to me in my life and the way I think about our relationship to forests. So after graduating school, I went to the university, or I, I'm sorry, I, I went to the Adirondacks to work for like a larger timber company and then for a smaller consulting forestry company at Montpelier and then became the Chittenden County Forester for the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation in Vermont. County foresters are service foresters, so we work for the state and help educate landowners and conservation organizations and forest stewards and forest lovers and whoever about how to improve the health of forests and the quality of forest management in our county. And that's really when I started to see the need for this book. So we would do, you know, go into people's forests and see all of these incredible threats and stressors that they face. Uh, one of the big themes across all of our forests here in Vermont is that uh, almost every forest in Vermont was an agricultural field within the last 100 years, which is difficult to think about, really, or to like wrap our heads around. But it's important that you know that like in the 1800s, in the span of a human generation, 30 years, and with crosscut saws and axes and draft animals, our state went from probably in excess of 90% forested to 20% forested. And we all, you know, many of, if you're raised in Vermont, that's a story that gets told to us in school, and we hear about like the Merino sheep craze. Um, what is not told to us necessarily is the fact that that uh, incredibly dramatic transformation of our landscape, which included, by the way, the loss of multiple wildlife species, the loss of multiple tree species, the loss of soil, the change in so many different parts of these ecosystems uh, pervades the way that they are today. So 
many of those forests, if not most of those forests, were maintained as agricultural land or repeatedly clear cut for the next 100 to 150 years to the point where the forests that we have in our landscape today are incredibly young, usually 60 to 100 years removed from either a, an agricultural field or a clear cut, and lacking basically all of the attributes that have defined forests on this landscape for thousands of years. Uh, our old growth forests, which is what forests have been on this landscape for thousands of years, uh, cover a tenth of 1% maybe of our landscape, maybe 1,000 acres statewide. And everything else are these forests that are incredibly altered. So in addition to that, our forests are dealing with this like panoply of threats and stressors that we refer to collectively as global change. So global change is uh, climate change and non-native invasive pests and pathogens, plants and animals, pollution, forest fragmentation, deforestation, the legacies of this past land use, deer overpopulation, all of these other things that collectively comprise the sum total of the threats and the stressors that our forests face in this moment. And we really can't help forests by responding to a single one of those things. We really have to like respond to all of them, which is incredibly nuanced. So I was walking in the woods as the county forester with all these thousands of people and seeing these forests that were struggling with all of these issues. And again, experiencing that dichotomy that even though I could describe to people these incredible challenges that these forests are facing, and even though I knew that using tools like the cutting of trees, we could actually affect major positive changes in these ecosystems, that still people who loved forests, which is most of the people that I walked with, still believed that the only expression of that compassion was just to do nothing. Even as all of those things we're converging on these ecosystems and threatening their ability to be resilient and healthy and vibrant. So I wanna just read, do a reading from the introduction of the book where I sort of describe how I started writing this book and what I was experiencing. And again, Bear Island is my land, which I'll talk about in a second. Once it seemed that there were only two paths to follow a status quo that saw forests and other ecosystems as commodities, and an opposing force that sought to protect ecosystems from ourselves, to leave them alone. As forests everywhere struggle under the weight of the many threats and the stressors of the modern world, as they suffer the legacies of the past and confront a future that promises challenges like never before, I have realized that neither of these two paths is enough. I have realized that the world needs action intertwined with compassion, relationship imbued with responsibility, death infused with life. I have gone my own way, fostering a divergent vision, a reimagining of what it means to love a forest, engaging in the radical act of trading simplicity for complexity, trading a tiny vision for one that is true. My journey toward these realizations has been long, and lonely and sinuous. In my little house at the foot of the mountain, my bookshelf is crowded with books about trees and plants and animals, birds and bears and fungi, the relationship between people and ecosystems and the threats both face. Never have I found a book that has articulated what a forest truly is, not just its botany and its biology, the contours of its many pieces and its parts, but how this entire living community moves and behaves and changes. Never have I found a book that described what it means to care for a forest like Bear Island, an ecosystem that has been changed and degraded and depleted and left to suffer alone. Never have I found a book that described the pain and the joy and the anxiety of trying to love and protect an ecosystem, of guiding it toward wholeness at this strange and crucial moment in time. No book has prepared me for the many complex and bittersweet choices that I would someday make at Bear Island, or for the fact that these actions would be celebrations, the substance of a truly radical and responsible relationship with a forest. In this book, I draw these disparate threads together, exploring what it means to love a forest in this changed and changing world. 
It is a new land ethic, a vision of relationship and responsibility, freedom and power, resilience and humility, legacy, beauty, and change. In a world that is both human and wild, both wounded and vibrant, both suppressed and emergent, this is a vision both for how we manage forests and take care of ecosystems, and how we manage ourselves, how we take care of each other. So one of the things that's really interesting about this work, right, we have this like perceived dichotomy, which isn't really true. And we also have all of these other misconceptions about forests that we need to like unpack before we can even like know what a healthy forest looks like. And then by extension, like know how to care for a forest. We can't care for a forest if we don't even know what a healthy forest is supposed to be like, right? Um, and in walking with these thousands of people, I've also noticed something that's remarkably consistent, which is that uh, if you were to bring a group of people into a forest and close their eyes and just ask them what a healthy forest looks like, what an ideal forest looks like, they would all say the same thing or would respond at least instinctively, intuitively with the same vision. And this is what it looks like. It's the cathedral, right? It's these big, perfect, widely spaced trees with this high arching canopy, with this understory that's completely open and clear that you can see right through. And there's no dead wood on the ground and there's no dead trees and it's just perfect. And if any one of us, regardless of whatever like training we might have or experience we might have, walked into a forest like that, on some level we would be like, <laughs> the perfect forest. Now, interestingly, that's not what a healthy forest looks like. And I would actually argue that it's almost the opposite of what a healthy forest actually looks like. So when we look at our remnant old growth forests, which are a really good, again, reminder of what forests have looked like on this landscape for thousands of years, which is important not just because it's like cool to know, but also because those are the conditions, the conditions that we find in old growth forests are the conditions to which all of our native biodiversity, all of our species are adapted to. Those are the conditions under which they evolved on this landscape. So when we look at our old growth forests, what we see is that they are very messy. They don't adhere to that vision. There are big trees, but not a lot. Like let's say 10 to 12 big trees per acre would be a good average. They are equally defined by being multi-generational, by having what we would call in the ecological parlance structural complexity or structural diversity, what I just call multi-generationality, uh, which is many different sizes and ages of trees. Each generation of trees resulting from tree mortality and the ensuing regeneration, which has happened again and again and again over hundreds or thousands of years. This process of tree mortality, which is as ancient and as normal and arguably as essential as the life of trees. Equally foundational to these ecosystems is dead wood laying on the ground. What a waste, right? But you got to remember that this process of tree mortality, these trees, especially in Vermont, our main source of mortality is wind throw. Uh, trees blowing over, falling on the ground, is itself a foundational habitat to thousands of species of living things, as well as being foundational to critical ecosystem functions like soil building, forest hydrology, and many other things. So none of those things, you know, maybe the big trees, but not big trees that are that sparse in the forest, but certainly not that multi-generationality, certainly not that dead wood are present or welcome in this instinctive vision we have of like what forests are supposed to look like. And so it's this thing that we have to do where we have to actively go against our instincts and redefine what a healthy forest looks like. We have to recognize that an understanding of what forests are supposed to look like, what a healthy forest should look like, is not something that any of us are born with. 
It's something that we need to develop in our lives. And it actually goes against these instincts that we often have. And so it will actually make us uncomfortable. But until then, until we do that, uh, we really can't care for forests because we don't even know what we're trying to do. So in the first chapter of the book, it's called Reimagining Forests. I'm working pruning the apple trees in my orchard and juxtaposing this orderly, tidy system with the wild forests around it. A group of chickadees visits me, flitting from fence to fence. I pause to watch their circus. As my pruning shear is quiet, I hear nuthatches and dark-eyed juncos, the pounding of a pileated woodpecker on an aspen. As I have learned to recognize more of the forest birds, a cacophony has become a chorus. Each species of bird calls its own name. Each touches the forest in a different way, each finding habitat within different pieces and parts of the living community. Each is unique. A decade ago, I looked into the forest and saw faceless trees, each like the others. As I learned to tell sugar maple from red maple, the flat needles of hemlock from the angular needles of spruce, the peeling bark of paper birch from the creamy bark of aspen, the forest has become a creature of diversity and complexity and depth. Each tree species is habitat for different birds, insects, and mammals, each growing on different sites and in different ways, each flourishing different flowers and bearing different fruits. Each is precious. Once I saw forests as no different from orchards. I have since learned to reimagine the forest as something messy and imperfect, complex and undefinable, dynamic and expansive over space and time. I have learned to see the trees in the forest as the coral in a coral reef, the living structure at the center of a community of boundless depth and diversity. I have learned that an understanding of what healthy forests look like, how they work, and what it means to take care of them is not something that any of us are born with. It is something that we need to develop. I have learned that forests are not supposed to be pleasant or understandable or beautiful to us. They are what they are, and it is up to us to meet them there. Now when I look into the forest, I see kaleidoscopes of interactions and connections, critical pieces and parts as diminutive as a bed of moss on a rotting log, and as massive as a mountain, a region, a continent, a biosphere. Now I see that the fungi and the bacteria of the soil the insects, the mosses and the lichens, the beech and the oak, the deer and the owls and the bears, these things do not live in the forest. They are the forest. The windstorms and the ice storms, the forest fires and the floods, the death and the change, these things do not happen to the forest. They are the forest. Once I thought that being a forester meant being a caretaker of trees. Now I see myself as the caretaker of a reimagined forest, the steward of every piece of this incredible volume of life. So another real challenge that we face, right, is just even understanding like what a forest is. So we don't understand what they look like. And, and when you really start to look at them hard enough, you start to realize that our understanding of, of what a forest even is is limited, which also limits our ability to care for them, hence the reimagining. So it's another thing where just like I feel like everybody can summon this idea of what this beautiful, perfect, healthy, idyllic forest is, I feel like everybody here and everybody that I talk to knows exactly what a forest is. And if we drill down on it, they'd be like, it's an area of, with trees. Right? You know it when you see it. You go out there, there's trees, there's forests. Um, and when, but when you really start to look into the ecology of these systems and how they actually function and all the different pieces and parts that make them work and that define them, uh, you start to see that that's the tip of the iceberg. A better definition for what forests are is from a book called Wetland, Woodland, Wildland, which uses this definition for something called a natural community. A natural community, by their definition, is, quote, an interacting assemblage of organisms, their physical environment, 
and the natural processes that affect them. So what I love about this is that just like when I'm saying, you know, the deer and the owls and the bears, these things are the forest. All of the windstorms and the ice storms and the forest fires, these things don't happen to the forest. They are the forest. Uh, it allows us to expand our definition of what the forest is. Because it's not just the trees. It's the trees and the plants and the animals and the fungi. And it's even the non-living parts of this system. It's the soils and the waters and the geology. And it's even the natural processes that change this system over time. The windstorms and the ice storms, tree mortality, all of these different elements of change. And by the way, if you really get into forest ecology, you start to see that they're defined not by their stability, their ability to resist change, but by their resilience, their ability to change while remaining vibrant. They are these incredibly dynamic ecosystems. As ancient as these trees get, they are really defined by how they change over time. And so again, what's important about that is that if I'm a forester, or if I'm the steward of a piece of forest land, and I'm going out to protect the forest, and I think that my job is to protect the trees, if a tree dies, or if I kill a tree, I have failed. It's over. I screwed up big time. And if my job instead is to protect this entire ecosystem, which has its own identity, trillions of organisms of tens of thousands of different species, some of which may require the death of trees, some of which may require that change, some of which may require natural processes that make us uncomfortable. If my job is to protect all of that stuff, then my choices become different. And my vision of what success looks like or what a positive relationship with these ecosystems looks like becomes different. So for me, when I realized that, it was incredibly empowering. Because I started to realize that there is room within these ecosystems for action. And that we don't have to be scared to do something like cut a tree. Because our job is really to take care of all of that stuff. And when we're forced to hold all of that stuff, it demands our action, even when it means something as bittersweet as cutting a tree. So, oh yes, I wanted to talk to you about Bear Island. So I was starting, you know, when I started writing this book, I was just living in an apartment in Burlington, working as the county forester, and, and then something really magical happened to me, which is that uh, my buddy said, hey, did you see that, that piece of land in Bolton uh, on that realtor's website? And I was like, no, I didn't see it. I looked it up, 175 acres. And the only picture was a picture of Camel's Hump. As if to be like, put your mansion right here, and you can look at Camel's Hump. And it's actually not, not really Camel's Hump as, as we know it, because you're looking at it straight on. So it's what, what I call Camel's Butt. So you're like, you don't see actually like the shape of Camel's Hump. You just see the butt. But I was like, I don't know. It's cheap, like what's wrong with it? And I decided to go take a look. And so I drove out there. My first impression was turn it on to the access road to get onto the land. And it was completely washed out. There was a ravine running down the center of it. I was like straddling it with the wheels of my truck. Rolled up onto the log landing, that clearing where they'd taken that picture from. And it was covered in trash. Bags of household trash, busted equipment, cables and hoses and buckets and just spider webbing out from it in every direction this network of these logging trails skid trails with these three foot deep ruts just running murky water down the mountain it was not a very good way to start uh, and i was like you know what i'm already here let's take a look and so i started walking up the main skid trail and it was incredibly steep and I was pulling ticks off myself, just getting covered in sweat. And I was walking, walking, and as I was walking, something was bothering me. And I couldn't put my finger on it. I was like, what is it? What's wrong here? And after I walked for about an hour, I realized that what was wrong was that I hadn't seen a healthy tree the whole time I'd been there. And I started looking around, and I was like, no healthy trees. No healthy trees. It was 
bizarre and jarring. What I now know is that what happened is it had been owned by a, a timber company and 30 years before, unsupervised by forest or anything else, the timber company just said to these loggers, go cut every tree bigger than 10 inches in diameter on the mountain. So 10 inches in diameter, that's like that big, around, pretty small. Uh, and they had done it, and they had been very, very thorough. And it's a practice that we call diameter limit cutting. It's not really forest management. It's probably closer to mining in that it's solely extractive in nature. Um, nested within these other unethical practices that we call high grading. So what high grading is, is if you go into the forest and you cut only the most valuable trees and you leave the least valuable trees behind. Unfortunately, those most valuable trees are almost always the healthiest trees in the forest. So what you're doing is essentially like the reverse of what any reasonable, irrational, or responsible forest steward would ever do. And the best analogy that I can think of to describe it is, it would be like if you went out into your garden in the middle of summer and you weeded out all the vegetables. Totally the reverse of what we would ever want to do, right? And it would create a situation where what you're left with are the weeds. Or you're left with, in this case, trees that we're not capable of responding to that moment and just like saying, geez, I got some more light. I'm going to be a healthy tree now. Um, there's an argument to be made that it would have been a greater kindness to that forest if they just cut all the trees. Because then at least a new generation of trees would have had a chance to respond and to grow. But instead, you know, they just pulled out all the healthiest ones, and then those least healthy ones closed their canopies, and there we were. As I was walking along, I was also noticing some tree disease. A lot of those trees were beech trees that were afflicted with this disease called beech bark disease. It basically prevents them from ever being a healthy tree. The impacts of deer overpopulation, so the forest was sort of trying to regenerate some other species, but as soon as they poked their heads up above the soil, they were getting eaten by deer. I slid over this band of cliffs that bisect the land from east to west and right into a 30-acre patch of a non-native invasive plant called Japanese barberry, which is the worst infestation I'd ever seen. Just monoculture, non-native plant, this tall, pure, 30 acres. And I was walking through that, just again, picking ticks off myself, just being like, what in the world is wrong with this place? And the answer was everything, right? And I got, went back to my truck, and I said, forget this place, I'm out of here. And I left. But then sure enough, over the next months, I started thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it and wondering if it was actually true that that place was like beyond hope. And I came back a second time. And when I came back a second time, I started finding all this cool stuff. So I found that there were some healthy trees there, after all, that were just hidden behind so many unhealthy trees that I hadn't seen them that there were plants that I loved, like sweet fern, maple leaf viburnum, and pink corydalis, and red columbine, low bush blueberries. There were these amazing rocky outcrops coated in reindeer moss with these sweeping views of the Winooski River Valley. And I was standing on one of those rock outcrops, and I said to myself, I'm going to do this. I'm going to buy this place. And so I went back, never bought a piece of land, never bought anything big like that before in my life. And I talked to my, my former boss who sold forest land real estate. And I was like, Mike, there's this piece of land. I want to buy it. How do I make an offer? What do I want to offer? What, do, what, what should I do? And he was like, well, uh, does it have any timber on it? And I said, no. And he was like, uh, any real estate potential? No. Is the access good? No. Could it be a sugar bush? No. And it kept on just like rolling down the line. Is it like this? Does it have this? No, 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 no. And eventually, uh, he said, well, Ethan, this place sounds terrible. Just offer them nothing. And don't be afraid of hurting their feelings. And so that's how I became the owner of this piece of land, Bear Island. Uh, and you know, what was so formative about this experience for me, of buying this piece of land, and then stewarding it over the following seven years was really engaging with like uh, the, the
the journey that I think many of us need to take as we try to figure out how to move forward in this world with these ecosystems that we are so reliant on. And that I believe in this moment also rely on us. It's one thing to believe that, you know, we've always done a bad job managing ecosystems. We as the, a human species, right? We've always done a bad job and surely the only thing that could be good for them would be removing ourselves from them. And that's a cool thing to say and makes sense in principle. And it makes much less sense when you're standing in a pile of trash at the bottom of this mountain in this forest that has every problem that a forest could have, watching thousands of years of soil just wash through those skitter ruts. And I had to ask myself in that moment if it would be a greater act of compassion for this forest, for this world, for future generations of people who are going to rely on ecosystems like this to do nothing and to hope for the best and hope that nature would somehow magically heal all of these problems or to do everything in my power to make this place healthy again. And needless to say, I, I chose the latter. Um, and then it was a journey to be like, okay, how do we actually do this? And again, what I found was that, boy, wouldn't it be nice if we could just go out there and we could just plant pretty plants and everybody feel good about it and it would be so easy and everything would be better. That would be awesome. And actually, uh, the things that this forest required of me in this moment were not easy. They were not like that. They were cutting trees, they were killing deer, teaching myself to run excavator and restoring all those skid trails, killing all those non-native invasive plants with herbicide. All of these things were things that I absolutely never thought I'd do. And all of them were things that if I hadn't done them, this forest was not gonna be okay. And you know, one of the best analogies that I can think of, I don't have kids myself, but I know that, for those of you who do, if you had a child, and if your child was sick and needed your help, and you went to see a doctor and they told you that they needed some kind of a treatment or a medicine that maybe you didn't agree with, maybe you wish you didn't have to do, wouldn't you, wouldn't you do it anyway? Any of us would. This is what we do for the things that matter and for the things that we care about. We make sacrifices. We make compromises. We do things uh, that we never thought we'd have to do. We face these incredibly tough moments where all that we want to do is just quit and go home, and we do it anyway, and we move forward. And what I started to see all of those things that I was doing at Bear Island as, was as these incredibly powerful and radical acts of compassion. And it leads me to a few different things. I mean, one thing that I need you to know is that, you know, while Bear Island sort of like had every problem that a forest could have and was this symbol in my mind of like everything that was wrong with the world when I first came there, uh, it is not unique. Every forest that I walk into is degraded. Every ecosystem that I walk into needs help, truly. Um, and one of the most amazing things that I realized in this journey was that, you know, I think we have this idea in this world that um, some like scientist in a lab somewhere or like engineer somewhere is like working on this magical thing that's gonna like, this magical tool that's gonna fix all of these problems that we have. And actually, we have the tools to solve many of these problems right now. Existing technology with existing resources. The only question is if we will do it. I wasn't out there using Space A's technology to transform Bear Island, which by the way now is incredibly vibrant and abundant and hopeful after seven years. I used diesel equipment, skitter and a chainsaw, which by the way are the same tools that the loggers used to degrade my forest 30 years ago, used in a different way to help it heal. 
I used an excavator, I used all these other things. Um, not least of which is another tool that has been used to degrade ecosystems and can also be used to help them heal, which is the energy and the power of the human body and the human will, right? Our hands are not poison. We do not ruin ecosystems just by being a part of them. And I think as long as we, as quickly as we can understand that, we'll be able to get to work and actually doing what we gotta do to care for them. So I wanna do one more reading and then I'll have, I'll have time for a couple of questions. Um, there's this other idea that I have about, again, that our work as people who live in this world, which, you know, I say sometimes like, our work as ecosystem stewards, and you might be like, I'm not an ecosystem steward. We all are, really. I mean, <laughs> we live in this world which, if you didn't know, we like literally can't live without ecosystems. Uh, we, like functionally, objectively, uh, can't, can't do it, can't be done. And so we all are vested in the health of these ecosystems, the health of this biosphere. Um, but we have this idea that like our job is, is just to keep this world from getting any worse than it is right now. And I'm not really interested in that at all. Um, I'm interested in building a better world. And if we're willing to do what's necessary, we have the opportunity not to just mitigate all of these bad things, but to actually uh, play a role in these ecosystems that is generative. Um, and that's what I really am excited to see for when that happens. The storm clouds stamp their feet. They are corralled along the shifting path of the big river, thundering between the walls of the broad valley. The clouds move west, driven like cattle toward the mountains. As empty as it often feels, there is something beautiful about a life lived in the aftermath. Here, in the junkyard of the Anthropocene, we hold the fate of the world, all of its ecosystems, all of its peoples in our hands. In this moment, we can allow this biosphere, our home, to sink further into dysfunction and disarray, or we can make the radical and bittersweet decisions necessary to choose a different path. Inside of this catalyzing moment, we have the opportunity to reimagine our relationships to ecosystems and our relationships to each other, to redefine what we are and what is precious to us. As empty as they often feel, there is something beautiful about a landscape, a forest that are just a fraction of their true potential. The forests of our lives are still only at the beginning of their journeys. They may yet become diverse and complex, rich with legacies, ancient again. With our help, these forests may rediscover a capacity for life beyond imagining, an abundance that this world has not known for generations. I pick up another acorn, another product of thousands of years of adaptation and change, another precious thing chained to the legacies of the past and hurtling toward an uncertain future. Perhaps it is doomed. Perhaps it contains endless possibilities. Humidity cloaks the land, drawing tiny round beads of sweat from my skin. For a moment, the mountain is cast in golden light. It smells sharp and strong. As my fingers touch another acorn, a raindrop strikes the back of my hand, rolling between the small bones of my fingers. Suddenly, droplets are stippling the soil like falling stars, throwing up little clouds of dust. I have nowhere to be and so I kneel, watching the water run around the stumps and the upturned leaves, drawing spider webs on the earth. Someday I will tell my children that the caves in the talus above are a womb, the origin of all the black bears on the mountain, and that the springs in the big bowl are the source of all of its waters. Someday I will walk these trails with my children and teach them to reimagine forests as communities of complexity and depth and expansiveness, communities that are fated to change, to celebrate both the miracle of life and the miracle of death. Someday I will kneel beside these stumps, a young forest blooming around me, 
and teach my children the imperfect truth of what it means to love a forest. Someday I will teach my children that this world is not ours to hold, but that we hold it anyway. That each of us is a steward for one brief and precious moment in time. Someday I will teach my children that despite everything, we are destined to thrive, that we are destined to live in a world that is beautiful. In the years to come, the traces of this moment will fade. This empty patch cut will have become a diverse young forest, the stumps softening and mixing with those of the oaks cut decades ago. I will walk through this young forest and remember this autumn day when my hands were young. I will remember that each tall, perfect oak was once an acorn between my fingertips, that this forest is a child of responsibility, something that we could only have embodied together. No one but me will ever truly know the pieces of myself that I have left on this mountain, the labor of love that being the steward of this land has been. I will know, and that is enough. We owe too much to the future to be imprisoned by the past. As the storm passes over me, I am grateful to be anything at all, grateful to be alive at a time when there is so much worth saving. I want to live in the world that will arise from this moment, the world built by people who are brave and humble and resilient, who make countless bittersweet compromises, who live their lives with the dream of a better world burning in their chests. I want to live in a world that will be created by people planting acorns in the rain. Sometimes this life feels like autumn, the exhausted end of a boundless summer. Today I choose to live in a world in which spring is just breaking, a world that is just awakening, just beginning to discover what it truly is. I look toward the broken ridge of the mountain and feel a powerful nostalgia, not for the past, but for the future. High above the storm, the light is swelling, calling everything upward toward a world that is just beginning. Thank you. We've got time for a couple of questions if anyone has one. Just elbow grease and Yankee ingenuity mostly. Um, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't pay for itself for the most part. I do sell some wood. Um, I sell log length firewood, which is basically all that I cut, which helps a little bit. Um, and then I also, I participate in some NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, which is a division of the USDA. They have some grant funding for landowners that do like wildlife habitat management, which helps pay for some of it as well. So the, the two programs, one of them is called EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Another one is called CSP, Conservation Stewardship Program, which really helps. You know, unfortunately, the folks that managed my land 30 years ago uh, didn't leave me a lot of options, right? So I don't have the option to go and cut a tree that's worth a bunch of money when it's tax time. Uh, so all the stuff that I do on my land is just like scrappy as hell. And honestly, it's like, it's such a labor of love. I mean, it's just, sometimes I have to be grounded in the reality that like not everyone in the world wants to spend 20 or 30 hours a week and like all of their money on uh, working in the woods, doing the most dangerous and taxing work imaginable. Uh, I know that that's true. But yeah, that's, that's what it is for me. Yes. It's, and it, I write about, there's, my favorite chapter in this book is, I think it's chapter six. It's the chapter about freedom. And there's a landowner in it who's just, Someone like a lot of like sounds like you and me and a lot of forest stewards out there who uh, it's a beautiful and hard thing to just be doing all this stuff and just managing for like this world that doesn't exist yet, like this future that you will never benefit from that, but you just do it anyway. And it's also like that's the stuff that really makes it worthwhile 
if there's something so radical, I'm like, I am just trying to heal this forest so that someone's great, great grandkids can have clean water, you know, and live in a world, a biodiverse world and live in a world where they can go into an ecosystem that's just like vibrant and abundant and beautiful and functional. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you something that is, is going to sound like a non-answer to this question, but it is actually like the most important answer, which is, um, it depends. So like a lot of this, the stuff that's in this book and a lot of this, you know, the message that I hope people carry away from this is like the, the nuance of a lot of this stuff, that there's, there's not one right way and one wrong way. There are many ways. Um, and it's critical that we're moving toward the right thing in, the, in that we are doing so in a way that's going to honor, you know, your forest's ability to be functional and, and vibrant. Um, but the way that we do that could be a lot of different things. So what I would recommend for you is check in with your forester. Check in with maybe call the county forester, who's a free resource for you that will just come out and take a walk with you for free. And they will help you like look at the specifics of your land and triage with you like what can be done and how to do it. Because some for some people, you know, you could do something, a big action or several actions, and then it could be 20 years when you're all you're doing is sort of waiting and watching. And um, and for other people, it might be more appropriate to do something every single year. It's yeah, it is. It is subjective in many ways, and but um, you know, and one of the things that we talk about, like a question that I keep on answering, and that I'm making a video about um, for my social media channels, is like, what's a healthy tree? Because people are like, what's a healthy tree? And it's a hard question to answer. Like, a metabolically healthy tree is a tree that is like growing really well, and it has no wounds or defects, and it has a nice, deep, well balanced, symmetrical crown. And that's a tree that's like in the prime of life, super healthy. And then also, one thing that we've had to wrap our head, heads around is like the fact that we can't have a forest that's just trees like that. Because if we do, we're missing out on all of these other critical ecological attributes that are vital not just to habitat for many different living things, but also vital to the function of forest because those living things perform really important ecological functions within the forest. Um, and I think so with a lot of this stuff, a key word, and I have a chapter about this as well, uh, is humility, right? So having the humility to recognize that we rely on ecosystems, having the humility to recognize that we haven't done a good job managing ecosystems in the past in many cases, having the humility to recognize we may never fully understand ecosystems, and then having the humility and the courage to act anyway and to do our best, and to recognize that things change, and to be willing to step out in the unknown with the best information that we have and the best intentions that we have, and to adapt. And I think that for, for those reasons, like humility is one of our, really one of our most important attributes as we go on this journey. But always with courage, right? Because you also have to be brave enough to, to step out there into the unknown and to act anyway. So thank you all. Yeah. And our friends at Yankee Books, um, if you're interested in buying a copy of the book, we'll do it, and I'll sign it for you if you want me to.